Welcome to this tech talk. Uh, my name is Steve Souders. I work here at Google on latency, web performance. And I've started bringing in a series of speakers. Um, so far, we've had John Rezig uh, from Mozilla, Doug Crockford from Yahoo, who's here today, uh, myself. Next week, we're going to have Rob Campbell, from who works on uh, Firebug at Mozilla. And today, we have uh, PPK. Um, so all of these talks, the videos are available on YouTube, and uh, you can read blog posts on the Google Code blog about them. Um, so PPK is in from Amsterdam. He's here for the Voices That Matter conference uh, up in the city next week. And he's most well known for his quirksmo.org work on browser compatibility. And uh, today, he's going to talk about W3C widgets and uh, how they can use, be used for mobile devices. I want to first, though, thank PPK for coming to Google and present him with the Google Tech Talk speaker goodie bag. Thank you. There you go. All right, please help me welcome PPK. Thank you. Um, today, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, mobile web. Um, I uh, myself started in web development 10 years ago, and 10 years ago, WAP was uh, the big thing in the mobile web. I'm not sure if you remember WAP, but it was, well, not very good, really. Um, and everybody was excited, except, uh, especially the marketing guys. They said, like, okay, WAP is going to be the next web, uh, big thing, and uh, uh, get ready because we'll get lots and lots of clients who want WAP sites that will work on mobile phones. It turned out that we did not get any clients who were interested in mobile phones back then. Um, the same was repeated uh, in 2002. Uh, back in Holland, uh, one of the telecom companies uh, tried to promote the Japanese iMode uh, system, and that basically failed too. Uh, since then, I've hardly worked uh, on the mobile web at all, until about uh, two and a half months ago, uh, Vodafone uh, contacted me uh, with the question, hey, uh, we're running into a bit of uh, trouble with uh, mobile browsers. Could you please help us out and uh, study the mobile browsers? And said, yes, of course I, I want to. And I was uh, really glad uh, about that, because I was already thinking about uh, the mobile web. It might start to be, become important in the next year, next two years, and I absolutely want to do some browser tests uh, on the mobile side of things, but uh, the problem was uh, that I'd have to uh, buy a lot of mobile phones to do in order to do some really serious testing. No problem, the Vodafone guy said, uh, we've got two closets full of, uh, of uh, mobile phones that you can test as far as we're concerned, so come over to Dusseldorf in Germany and uh, we'll get started. And I did, and I did some testing, and today I'd like to talk uh, about a few aspects of that testing and also about W3C widgets, uh, which Vodafone is currently supporting. Um, so, what exactly is the mobile web? Um, basically, it's simple, you get a website on your mobile phone. The problem is um, mobile phones are just not the same as desktop computers. And as far as I can see now, um, we've got four major problem areas uh, when you try to port a normal website to a mobile phone. The first one is that mobile phones generally have far less memory than a desktop computer, which means that uh, performance may be impacted. The second one is that they have a far smaller display uh, than a normal computer screen. The third one is that they have flaky browsers, and that problem is not really restricted to the mobile space, but it's worse there than in, on the desktop space. And fourth, uh, they have flaky connections. You cannot never be absolutely sure that your connection uh, will uh, stay on for the time it, you take to uh, download a certain website. Okay, um, I'm briefly going to discuss the uh, first two problems, and I'll go into more depth in the sec uh, second two problems. First of all, small memory, uh, I can't really say much about that because I haven't really tested it yet. Um, the only thing I know for sure is, is that performance tests are necessary. Um, one of the guys at Vodafone is currently doing some performance tests on mobile phones, uh, especially in relation to uh, the major libraries. Um, I hope that uh, research will be published uh, within a few months. I'll leave it at that. Um, I just don't know enough about uh, memory problems on mobile phones. Second uh, problem is the small display of mobile phones. We all know that. Uh, basically, uh, any uh, website you create today is optimized for, say, 1024 by 768. That will no way fit into a mobile display. Um, 
the good part about this problem is that people have been aware of it for uh, years already and have started uh, to think about it. And of course, the main solutions will lie uh, in the realms of graphic design and interaction design. Uh, I'm not a graphic designer or an interaction designer, so I'm not going to talk about uh, those uh, parts of the uh, solution. I'd just briefly like to touch on uh, the way uh, to technically solve this problem. Um, basically, um, if, you want to, if you need to optimize your CSS for a mobile uh, display, uh, you should use media queries, as far as I'm concerned now. Um, you use uh, the syntax you see over there, at media all, and max with 300 pixels, which means these styles, the uh, special styles for the small display, will be used when the display is uh, 300 pixels wide or smaller. Um, that, I think, will solve most of the CSS problems we can encounter on mobile phones. Again, I'm talking only about the technical problems we may encounter. Interaction design and graphic design is a totally different thing. But I think you need uh, CSS uh, media queries uh, to solve these problems technically in CSS. They are supported by Opera, iPhone, Bolt, and Iris. Uh, Bolt and Iris are WebKit-based web browsers. I'll get back to them later. Uh, they are not supported by the Android, at least not the current Android. Maybe Android 1.5 will change that, but we'll see. Um, if you want to solve this problem with uh, JavaScript, uh, you have to use the good old offset width. Document.body.offset width smaller than 300 generally works on all phones I've tested so far, except that the BlackBerry may have some problems with it. Um, so offset width is uh, basically safe. Offset height is slightly less safe because that's where the BlackBerry may have some problems. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that uh, for the small display. Uh, I hope that uh, pretty soon someone who's really, really good in interaction design or graphic design will take it up from here and explain us what we need to do uh, in order to make our websites really mobile phone compatible with regards to the small display. Now, flaky browsers. Um, the problem is nothing new, of course. Uh, anyone who's uh, been working on websites for longer than a few months will... Uh, will have recognized that some browsers do stuff differently than other browsers. Um, basically, the same is uh, going on on mobile phones, except that, unfortunately, there are far more browsers involved. Um, well, thanks to the support from the Vodafone guys, uh, I was able to test, uh, uh, to run a few simple tests on uh, 19 different browsers on 13 different phones. Uh, I chose the number 19 myself. Uh, I mean, I can test it on many more browsers if I want to, but uh, right now I think 19 is enough. Uh, I need to preserve some of my sanity. Um, let's first take a quick look at uh, which mobile browsers there are. Um, the Android WebKit, obviously. Opera Mobile, the Netfront browser, it's a pretty obscure uh, browser from, uh, I think it's from Japan, uh, not much is known about it except that it's uh, the default browser on some uh, Samsung and Sony Ericsson phones. Then we've got Safari for the iPhone, obviously. We've got Opera Mini, uh, which is a thin client, uh, I'll get back to uh, that. And then we've got the BlackBerry browser, which is uh, still an independent browser. Uh, we've got the S60 WebKit. S60 is the uh, operating system that most Nokia phones run on. We've got IE Mobile, and that is uh, very much of a problem right now. And of course, we've got some minor browsers such as Iris Bolt, Skyfire, Obigo, OpenWeb, Nokia S40, Palm Blazer, Fennec, T Shark, etc., etc., etc. T Shark, yes, T Shark. I have no idea why anyone would want to call this browser T Shark, but these guys have done it anyway. Okay, so this is a mess. You have absolutely no idea what's going on, and you will probably quickly get lost in this whole list of browsers. It's probably not complete either, but uh, these are the browsers I've been able to discover so far. And if you wish, you may grow now. This is going to be a major problem on the mobile web. Um, of course, all these browsers have their own problems with advanced JavaScript and CSS. I'm currently investigating them. I'm currently creating uh, mobile compatibility tables for them. But it turns out, that you have to test really basic stuff too, such as font style italic. I was doing uh, an advanced CSS selector test uh, in uh, an Opera 8, and it turned out that they did not support uh, some advanced uh, attribute selectors in CSS, which I thought weird, because I know for sure that Opera has been supporting these selectors for ages. Um, then I took another good look at my test, 
and I figured out what the problem was. If these advanced selectors are supported, then a certain bit of text uh, is, being, is given a font style italic. And it turned out that this specific opera did not support font style italic. So uh, it took me quite a while to figure that out. Uh, I had to tr uh, switch my tests uh, to working with color red or color blue, I can't remember. Well, that's not so much, so much of a problem. The basic problem here is that you can't even assume basic CSS support. And I've got some screenshots here to prove it. Uh, this one's pretty good, actually. This is an Opera Mobile 9.5 on an HTC phone, touch phone. And uh, this is my complete uh, basic font CSS test. And as you see, it supports everything. The problem is, there's a catch. It supports everything in desktop mode. Because it turns out that Opera Mobile has two modes, desktop mode and mobile mode. In desktop mode, it tries to show uh, your pages uh, basically as they are shown on, on a computer screen, which may mean that initially you only see the top left corner of your website and you have to scroll down and to the right in order to see the complete website. Uh, mobile mode uh, kind of squeezes the entire site uh, into the mobile display, which is good, I suppose. Um, the only problem is that they have to ov overrule some CSS, uh, obviously with uh, statements, uh, some floats probably. Uh, they have to uh, mess with them in order to force the entire site into the small display. But they also um, stop supporting some basic font CSS, and frankly, I do not understand why. Uh, I hope I'll find out later. In any case, uh, I know that it is the case. Uh, so you'd better uh, be ready for that. Uh, worse even, you cannot really detect whether an Opera Mobile is in desktop or in mobile mode. Um, I found a quick CSS uh, workaround, but it's not really useful in uh, real sites. So this is going to be a problem. Um, we go uh, down the line a little bit. Uh, this is an S60 WebKit, a Nokia E71. And the support is pretty fine, except that font variant, uh, small caps, it's... Uh, it looks the same as text transform uppercase. This is not so much of a problem. We can probably work around that. As the, the Opera Mini browser uh, on the same phone uh, supports everything except letter spacing, which is also not so bad. The only thing is um, we've been assuming for ages that all modern browsers support uh, these basic CSS uh, declarations. And it turns out that not all mobile browsers support everything. Okay, it can get much worse. This is a Netfront browser on a Sony Ericsson phone, and as you see, it only supports the basics. It supports font weight, font style, text decoration, color, but not much else. Um, this is the first pointer I received, that Netfront, it's not a really bad browser, but it's not really good either. We'll get back to that later. And absolutely the worst uh, browser I found was an Opera Mobile 8.00 on the Motorola, which supports only color and text transform, CSS-wise. Uh, now, I think uh, this uh, Opera Mobile is actually locked in mobile mode, as opposed to, to the previous Opera we saw, which uh, was in desktop mode. Uh, the problem is that on this specific mo Motorola, I cannot switch from uh, mobile mode to desktop mode. Maybe they introduced it later than Opera 8.00, I don't know. Anyway, um, I was unable to, uh, to get more support than just for te text transform and color, which is pretty basic, I suppose. Okay, um, I could show you many more screenshots, but they'd only confuse you more. Uh, I think it's time to take a look at the browser market uh, at the bird's eye view. I am warning you, these are preliminary conclusions. I'm not sure of my data yet. I have to run many, many more tests. But I think the browser landscape looks roughly like this at the moment. Uh, the top level browsers are the Android WebKit, Safari for the iPhone, and Opera Mobile. These browsers are basically uh, able to support uh, CSS and JavaScript normally. Uh, when we go to the mid-level, we've got uh, the S60 WebKit, uh, and I probably should say something more about WebKits on mobile phones. Um, many browsers uh, have WebKit as their uh, core rendering engine, but that does not necessarily mean that they do exactly the same. Uh, in general, it's best to see the Android WebKit and the Safari WebKit as brothers, they are pretty much alike, but not totally alike. Uh, and the S60 WebKit and other WebKits we'll see as more distant cousins. Um, the S60 WebKit uh, posed a few problems for me. 
um, because uh, when I s started my research, uh, I tried to write, read out its uh, browser identification string, obviously, and it gave back uh, the WebKit version number 422, which is pretty old. Um, while I, uh, and then I compared it with uh, Safari 3.0, which supports, I think, WebKit 525 or something. So uh, in theory, uh, the WebKit engine, the S60 WebKit engine is really old. The funny thing was that Safari 3.0 does not support the only child selector in CSS, while the S60 WebKit does. So what I think happened is uh, that uh, the S60 guys first branched off their own WebKit and subsequently imported uh, more modules from the main WebKit branch but forgot to update their uh, user uh, agent string. I'm not sure that this is what happens, but I think this is what happens. Um, S60 WebKit has a few problems in CSS I found so far. Uh, it does not support border spacing and it does not support a padding set in EMs. And that's uh, all I know about uh, S60 WebKit uh, bugs right now, but I'll probably find many more. Uh, meanwhile, I've learned that the Nokia S60 system is not very important in the US. It is extremely important, however, in Europe and especially in the developing world, where uh, I just saw some statistics yesterday, and basically in India and Indonesia, uh, Nokia phones take about 60% of the market share. And I'm not sure how many of those 60% are actually S60 phones, which are the most modern Nokia phones currently available. But I wouldn't be surprised uh, if, that, uh, if their share is starting to grow. So even though in the US Nokia S60 phones are not very important, in the rest of the world they are, and your website should run on them. Right, BlackBerry. Um, the BlackBerry uh, phone still has its own browsers, browser. Excuse me. Uh, I heard a rumor that they were going to switch to uh, a WebKit branch, but uh, as of today, that rumor is not, not yet true. I tested the BlackBerry Storm 9500, and uh, that ran uh, a browser that was definitely different from WebKit. It was definitely not a WebKit browser, so it's still an independent browser. It supports CSS2 pretty well, actually. CSS3 support is a bit more flaky. Um, and JavaScript support is okay, I guess, uh, although it refuses to run one of my test, test scripts. But all in all, I think it's a, a surprisingly decent browser. I'd expect it far worse. Then we've got Opera Mini. Opera Mini um, is the thin client browser of Opera. Basically, it works as follows. You only download a small uh, thin client on your computer. When you request a page through it, that request goes to a special Opera server, which in, turns, in turn requests the page, uh, renders the CSS, interprets the JavaScript, and sends the result back to the thin client on your phone. Um, this is an excellent solution for all the phones uh, who, have, uh, who don't have enough memory uh, to support real JavaScript, real client-side JavaScript. Um, the only problem is that as soon as an, a JavaScript event take, takes place, the browser has to go back to the server uh, in order to ask the server what to do next. So any JavaScript event will cause a page refresh. Um, this is mainly the reason I'm, uh, I'm counting it as a mid-level browser right now. There is no real client-side interactivity. Nonetheless, uh, the solution that Opera has chosen is probably pretty okay for uh, older mobile phones, and that's really their target audience. They want to spread Opera Mini uh, on many uh, older mo modern phones, especially in the former East Bloc and in the developing countries. So those are the mid-level browsers, and let's go to the very bottom level. There's NetFront. Uh, NetFront is, uh, as far as I know, a Japanese browser uh, created by the, a company called Axis. Unfortunately, there's very little uh, information available right now. I've tested it, and it supports CSS okay-ish, I guess. JavaScript a little worse. It can do some JavaScript. I mean, uh, it's not that uh, JavaScript is completely switched off. Um, and the really funny thing about NetFront, the very, very first time I tested it, uh, I started up a mobile phone, a Samsung, I started up the browser, and automatically the browser loaded a certain Vodafone homepage with nice advertisements and stuff. Um, and then I typed in the URL, URL to my test page, and nothing happened. And that kind of surprised me, because there was a, a progress bar that definitely showed some progress, and then it, uh, the progress bar disappeared, so I guessed, okay, my page will be finished loading, but I still saw the Vodafone homepage. It turned out that I had to scroll before my own page showed on this NetFront browser. And that was very weird to me, 
Um, uh, it only happened on one of the three net fronts I test. I tested, so it's not, uh, definitely not a, a general failure of all net fronts. Still, it's odd, and that's why I place it at the bottom level uh, of the mobile f uh, mobile browser sphere right now. But that may change in the future. And then we've got the old IE mobile. The old IE mobile supports only inline events, which means that document dot on click just doesn't work. Uh, create text node does not work. Uh, CSS support is horrible. It's based on the uh, old IE4 rendering engine. Meanwhile, Microsoft uh, is working uh, on an upgrade of the IE Mobile browser. It's going to be called IE Mobile 6, I think, and it's based on the IE6 rendering engine, not on the IE8 one, unfortunately. Uh, although they are supposed to be importing part of the IE8 uh, JavaScript engine, but I don't really have the details on that yet. So, um, what all these browsers have in common, with the exception of Opera Mini, is that they are default browsers on certain phones. So, uh, if a, a phone user does not know much about browsers and just starts using his phone to access the web, uh, he will use whatever default browser happens to be installed on his phone. So, that's why all these browsers are important for websites. Um, there are a few other default browsers, uh, but these work only on uh, really old phones. Open Web, Nokia S40, and Palm Blazer. Haven't tested them, that, them yet, so I can't tell you anything about it. And finally, we've got some non-default browsers. Iris, uh, Iris is Windows Mobile uh, WebKit-based. Bolt is uh, JME-based and also WebKit-based. Skyfire is Gecko-based. Obigo, I don't know yet. Fennec is the new Mozilla browser, which only runs in an early alpha on a certain Linux operating system on Nokia tablets. Uh, T-Shark, I don't know anything about. Uh, what these browsers have in common is that users may download them if they feel uh, like it. Uh, so these are not default browsers, and therefore I think they are less important than uh, the other browsers I show uh, on top. Okay, that pretty much concludes uh, my overview of the mobile browser market right now. Um, it's not easy. Um, I, uh, I talked about this uh, a bit earlier, and I got the question, okay, how should you test these browsers? Basically, you have to test them on mobile phones. Yes, there are emulators available. Some of them may, may even be good, but uh, I advise you not to count on it and just try to test your uh, websites as much as possible on the actual mobile phones you want to support. From flaky browsers, we uh, move to flaky connections. And um, the basic problem uh, with a mobile phone network is that if the guy next to you is downloading a few movies, your network connection will slow down, regardless of how good uh, it's supposed to be originally. And frankly, I do not think that this uh, problem is going to disappear anytime soon. Uh, networks uh, will be, uh, be upgraded, of course, and they will uh, be able to handle man much more traffic than today. But that means that many more people are going to start downloading movies, which still slows down the now much faster network. So flaky connections are, I think, uh, the most persistent problem uh, on mobile we're going to face. And um, it's, of course, a serious problem for the mobile web. Um, especially when you've got, uh, let's say, uh, a, uh, a web application for spreadsheets, totally optimized for the mobile phone, and it uh, keeps track of the display and makes sure you can actually work on it on the mobile phone, but it needs 200K of JavaScript plus a few libraries. Um, if this is a normal web application, every time a user accesses this web application, he has to download the 200K of JavaScript plus a few libraries, plus some CSS, obviously. Caching isn't always reliable uh, on mobile phones. Uh, I've seen wild extremes by now. Basically, the iPhone doesn't do any caching at all, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the exact opposite is the S60, uh, Nokia S60 phones, which have very, very aggressive caching. So aggressive that it actually hurts you when you're trying to uh, develop a mobile website or a widget. But uh, I kind of uh, advise you not to rely too much on caching on mobile phones uh, nowadays. So, um, a solution to the flaky connections problem is to put all the core files on your mobile phone so that you only need to download the data. 
of course, you have to download the core files uh, if you uh, install the, let's call it an application or a widget or whatever. Um, but once you've done that, the core files are on your mobile phone. You do not have to download them. And uh, the, uh, mo uh, the mobile connection can concentrate on the data traffic. Um, one, of the uh, one of the systems that offer these solutions are W3C widgets, and I've studied them a bit uh, in the past few months because Vodafone is working on them, and I'd like to uh, take a closer look at them. Um, basically, uh, these W3C widgets are local applications written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, plus a little bit more, not much, but a little bit. Uh, they run in a browser, obviously. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they can run in any browser, although on the Vodafone system currently do uh, run in Opera Mobile. And obviously, they can handle Ajax requests for the data traffic because they support JavaScript and they run in a browser. That works fine. Um, of course, uh, this uh, approach is uh, not uh, only taken by the W3C widgets, but basically by any uh, modern application system on a mobile phone. For the iPhone, the Windows Mobile, the BlackBerry, the Android, etc., etc., etc. The problem I have uh, with uh, these uh, app systems is that they're proprietary. I'm not sure exactly how much uh, the various app system, uh, systems resemble each other, but I am pretty sure that you have to test a separate app on each uh, mobile system that you want to support. And this is going to be a problem for companies, I think. Back home in Amsterdam, uh, two friends of mine have a website where you can view uh, nice uh, photos of interior design and stuff like that. The idea is that their clients uh, will come to their site, uh, look at interior design photos, and kind of uh, fa um, favorite those photos that they like, and then they want to go to the shop to actually buy these products. Um, now, these friends of mine um, would be served by uh, a mobile app that allows their clients to download these photos from the website and so that they can go to the shop and show, uh, show the salesman, okay, I want this thing, I want this lamp or this bed or this chair or whatever. Uh, that would be very useful to them. The problem is uh, that right now um, this, uh, uh, executing this idea is going to be difficult. Um, basically what they can do is then they can create a website. Actually, they already have a website. So they can say to their clients, okay, open uh, the website on your mobile phone, go to your favorites page, and you can show the photos to the salesman. The problem is uh, that website may be slow to load, especially when you want to download, uh, say, five to ten uh, large photos. It may go quick, it may go slow, you don't know beforehand. Flaky connection problem. Um, the other solution they may take is uh, create four or more separate applications, one for the iPhone, one for the Android, one for BlackBerry, one for Windows Mobile, etc., etc., etc. And that is certainly going to be pretty expensive. Uh, so the solution I'd like them to be able to use is use W3C widgets. So it's time to talk a bit more about W3C widgets. I think they are better than websites for the mobile phone because they avoid uh, the flaky connection problem. They, are, um, they download only data and not the core files. The core files are already installed on your phone. Um, and I also think they may be better than uh, the proprietary app systems we have right now because you don't have to write four, five, 10, 12, uh, whatever number of them, just the one. Um, and I'm looking into the future now, but what I'd really, 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 really love to do is have a cool widget on my phone. Say I've got an Android phone. I meet friends who also uh, want that widget, and I'm able to share it via Bluetooth. Even if I use an Android, and if a friend of mine uses a Nokia S60, or an HTC Windows mobile phone, or a BlackBerry, or, or whatever. I just open a Bluetooth connection, he receives my widget, and it just works. That is the future I envision. That is, is something I'd really uh, like to work on because I think uh, this will, uh, give, uh, will uh, open the web faster than any other uh, possibility on mobile phones right now. I may be wrong, but we'll see. In any case, I feel that this way of uh, sharing widgets would be absolutely, astoundingly, totally, inconceivably in, uh, interoperable. I mean, I think you can't get much more interoperable than this. I hope you agree with me. 
Um, besides, the advantage of widgets is that hundreds of thousands of web developers already know how to create them because they just run in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They have to uh, take care of the small display. They have to know, like, say, uh, one page uh, of extra features that are supported in W3C widgets, but that doesn't take more than half an hour of study. It's really pretty simple. And then it would just work. Basically, what you do when you, when you want to create a W3C widget, you create one HTML page, and you attach as many CSS files, JavaScript files, and image files as you need. Um, you add an icon, which a user has to click in order to start up the widget. You add a config.xml file, uh, which uh, contains uh, some con configuration information. It's really simple. You can uh, really learn that in 15 minutes. You zip the lot, change the extension to WGT, and it's just works. Um, so that's why I think that widgets uh, may be able to open the web faster and for more people than any other system. Um, basically, people can easily create them if they're already web developers, and they don't have to be wonderful, great web developers to make a widget. A widget can also be something simple. So they have to be web developers in the sense that they know some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They can easily create them. Ideally, they'll be able to easily share them with their friends uh, via Bluetooth or whatever, and they just work. So in that situation, why would we need anything else but W3C widgets? Actually, there are a few reasons why we might need other systems. I think uh, that uh, a proprietary application system, uh, such as uh, the ones we're having right now, may remain more suited for certain forms of applications, especially animation-heavy heavy games. Uh, it's a sad and sorry truth that JavaScript is not the best language to use when you uh, want really good, smooth, really good animations. Uh, another uh, area where app systems may, may be better are secure applications. I'm not sure about this. I mean, I'm not a security guy. Uh, so I, I'm just uh, assuming that uh, W3C widgets may, uh, may be less secure than uh, proprietary applications. I think, actually, there uh, we will find uh, some more areas in which app systems are better than W3C widgets. Um, besides native app systems, proprietary app systems too may foster innovation. And uh, if everything goes right, uh, W3C widgets will also profit from that. And so my conclusion is that proprietary systems are fine as long as you also support the standards. And W3C widgets are not yet a standard. They are in draft stadium right now. Well, you know all about that. But still, they may become a standard. And um, that's what I'm here to talk about. Because widgets just work. But not right now, unfortunately. Um, let's see where they do work, because they do actually work. I created a, a, a few uh, W3C widgets myself. And they absolutely work in the Vodafone widget manager uh, for uh, Nokia S60 phones. And that's the main reason Vodafone invited me uh, to come to them, uh, help us create these widgets on the Vodafone widget manager platform, uh, which uh, runs uh, Opera as a browser, Opera Mobile. So a 60 market is covered. Um, then uh, last week, Opera announced uh, that I had created a similar uh, widget manager for T-Mobile. Unfortunately, uh, I don't, don't know many of the details yet, but we think uh, that this uh, widget manager will run on mo Windows mobile phones because all of the screenshots we, we saw uh, used uh, Windows mobile uh, phones. So uh, we're guessing, but I think that Windows Mobile may be covered too. Um, I think that uh, a W3C widget uh, may easily be ported to the Nokia widget runtime system on S60, because that basically works the same, except that it uses an info.plist file, just as the Apple dashboard widgets do. So I'm kind of guessing, I haven't tested it myself yet, but I'm kind of guessing that if you create a W3C widget with a config.xml, and you add an info.plist file, which is uh, syntactically correct, the widget will also run on the Nokia widget runtime. But I still have to test that, so I may be uh, slightly wrong. But still, the concept is absolutely the same. So we've got uh, S60 covered twice and Windows Mobile covered once. Um, that's it for now, unfortunately. 
Um, um, now we come to the main reason uh, I'm here today. Um, I would love to um, ask the people from Google Android whether it would be possible that Google Android also starts to support uh, W3C widgets. Um, I have no idea. Are there any people from the Google Android team here? Yeah, okay. Um, I would uh, kindly ask you to think about this, think about my uh, presentation. Uh, I have, of, of course, absolutely no idea uh, if uh, this is, going, uh, is something that can be implemented easily or whether it will be very hard, but I wanted to make the attempt anyway. Um, by the way, I do not ask for widgets instead of, but in addition to your own widget system. I mean, as I said before, uh, native proprietary uh, application or widget systems may have their advantages, and we sh certainly should uh, continue to work with them. What you need uh, for a W3C widget environment is a browser, and of course, Android WebKit is fine. Um, the second point I'm a bit vague about, because I don't know exactly how that works, either on an Android or on any other phone type, but we need a way of associating widgets with uh, the browser uh, and or a kind of an installation mechanism. In any case, the phone has to be able to understand, okay, I get a .wgt file, I have to open that in a widget environment which uses the native browser of the system. Finally, what we need is uh, JavaScript device APIs, which brings me to the last subject I'd like to treat today. Basically, JavaScript device APIs are APIs that grant access to phone functionality, such as the camera, the contact list, text messages, etc., etc., etc. And I think uh, for real uh, W3C widgets, um, we uh, need this kind of access because it will tie the widget more closely into the mobile phone environment. And I think the users will also expect this. Um, right now, uh, there are several uh, JavaScript device APIs. Um, the Bondi one is supposed to become the standard, but it's not yet finished. Uh, besides, I tried to read it, and it's unfortunately pretty much unreadable right now. Um, so uh, I'm afraid we'll have to wait. Uh, Bondi is an is initiative of many uh, mobile phone vendors and uh, mobile operators. So um, it's a bit akin to the W3C in that respect. And they are supposed to formulate one common uh, JavaScript device API that will work on all mobile phones. Um, we've got the PhoneGap library. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but uh, I would like to mention it. Uh, as far as I understand, the PhoneGap library will uh, bring a JavaScript device APIs to the Android, BlackBerry, and iPhone platforms. Then we've got uh, the Opera T-Mobile widget manager I men mentioned earlier. According to the rumors, there is a JavaScript device API involved, but we kind of guess right now that it's proprietary and that it's restricted to Windows Mobile. Nonetheless, it's out there. However, uh, JavaScript device APIs also have a security problem. Um, suppose uh, my vision comes, becomes true and I can receive uh, a widget from a friend of mine via Bluetooth and that widget uses device APIs. How am I going to know that that, device, uh, that, that widget is not going to steal my contact list and upload it to a malicious server? Um, I'm not a security guy. I cannot give you the details of this. Uh, the only thing I know right now, what I've heard, is that, that the problem will probably be solved by signed widgets uh, that are assigned security levels. Basically, if your widget is not signed, you are relegated to the lowest possible security level. And on the lowest security level, any device API call will uh, alert the user, hey, can, the, can this widget please use your contact, contact list or your text message or whatever. And of course, higher level, uh, higher levels of security have more privileges. Again, um, I do not know too much about security. Um, this problem uh, is obviously pretty serious, and we obviously need to study it pretty well. Uh, I hope uh, Google can help us uh, figure out a good answer. Um, and that brings it to my, to my very last subject. Um, also about security. Basically, JavaScript's same source policy is not implemented in widgets. Uh, normally, uh, a JavaScript is only allowed to mess with a page or data that come from the same server. 
However, that does not make sense for widgets because uh, a widget is a local application. Its URL starts with something like widget uh, colon slash localhost slash whatever. So it's definitely a local application, but it has to be able to download data from other sources. So um, this uh, too is uh, something that we uh, need to think about really well because it might uh, become a serious security problem in the future. And I'd like to handle these uh, problems right now before they come, become really, really serious. So to wrap it all up, the pros of W3C widgets are that they work with open standards, that countless people around the world can already create them today, um, that they promise to deliver interoperability on a massive scale, um, and that I feel they will open the web more quickly and more certainly than uh, any other system on mobile phones. The cons are that uh, other uh, application systems may remain better suited for certain types of applications, uh, animation-heavy games, possibly uh, secure applications. Um, this is not really a con, it's just uh, something uh, we should uh, keep in mind. Um, another con is that as yet they are moderately supported, uh, but I hope the support will become much better uh, in the coming years. And the final, final and very serious con is uh, that we have some serious security issues that need to be solved because, before we can start using, using with on our chill. Um, as far as I can see now, uh, the pros heavily outweigh the cons. The only really, really serious con is um, the security thing. And uh, if we solve that, or if we at least um, kind of get to a situation where people can use uh, W3C widgets in a moderately secure way, we, will, uh, we can be certain that the pros of W3C widgets heavily outweigh the cons. And I guess it's time to get, go to work on the widgets. Thank you for your attention. I hope you learned something today. And if you have questions, I'll, of course, take them. Thanks. Yeah, question. No, you. Um, the question was uh, if I had uh, compared uh, the W3C widgets with uh, Google, uh, Google widgets and uh, Apple Dashboard. Um, as far as I know, uh, Apple Dashboard does work with uh, some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but I have not really compared them yet. So uh, I, I'm not quite sure. I think there will be uh, certain, uh, certain overlaps, absolutely, but I'm not sure how big these overlaps are. Yeah. Okay, you have solved the problems I have with Google Gadgets. That sounds good. Steve. Uh, the question is, if you develop a widget, is there a kind of an app store? Uh, the, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Vodafone is setting one up. And um, the only thing I uh, would like to reiterate is that the power of widgets is partly that you do not have to go through an app store. You can just share them with your friends eventually at a later stage. But uh, yes, for the moment, uh, there are app stores. I also think we are going to need app stores in the future um, because of the security problems. Somebody has to sign those widgets and say, OK, uh, this widget um, uh, may uh, remain secure. You say no, Douglas? Okay, according to Douglas Crockford, it's not going to work here, signing. We'll see. Alex. Okay, okay. That, uh, Alex Russell also say, says that signing is not going to work. Um, okay, so, uh, but you do agree that we have a security issue here that should be solved, right?
how do I see HTML5 in this respect? Um, I see it uh, primarily uh, as a good way of uh, storing data locally. Of, obviously, HTML5 storage is going to become massively important on mobile phones. Um, as to uh, storing the actual core files, uh, uh, in contrast to the data, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, this is something we will have to investigate. But basically, um, for really, really good widgets, uh, HTML5 uh, uh, is absolutely required, especially because of the storage. More questions? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just heard about a new uh, mobile phone browser here, the Sidekick. Uh, it seems to be pretty popular in the US. The problem with me, of, of course, is that I'm doing research in Europe, and one of the things I've noticed with the mobile market is that, is, uh, that the US is separate from Europe, is separate from Asia. So uh, the data I showed you um, mainly goes for Europe, partly also for Asia, especially in the Nokia case. Uh, Samsung is also very big in Asia, of course. But uh, the US, I don't know too much of, about the US market. But, but uh, thanks for the tip. I'll look into it. I'm just hoping that Vodafone has an actual sidekick phone so that I can test it. That's always, always the problem. Uh, many people tell me about many mobile phones. T-Mobile. Okay. I'll try. Thanks. Any other? Steve. Uh, yeah, it, um, the spec is a, it's a bit of a mess right now in that there's no uh, official homepage. Um, you can find it uh, through my site. I wrote uh, an article, Introduction to W3C uh, Widgets, uh, earlier this week, and contains a link to uh, the specification, or rather the, uh, what was it called, APIs and something specification, because there's also a specification for uh, distributing uh, them and zipping them. Um, there is a guy from Opera involved in the W3C widget specification, Marcos Carqueles, I think he's uh, named. And uh, he thought up uh, part of the system. Any more questions? No? Oh. Do you know the, the dog type test that Mark Gordon put together? No, I do not know that dog type test. So the dog type is, what he's done is basically do a test for every element of HTML CSS. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's an HTML uh, test here uh, that I uh, might look into. Uh, the problem, as far as I can see now, is not HTML as such. Uh, I have not yet found a single instance in which an actual HTML tag was uh, misinterpreted. But uh, that could come, of course, later on. CSS as well. Uh, okay, CSS as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, CSS is going to be a major problem. Any more questions, remarks? No? Well, thank you for your attention. Thanks for coming here.